In this last example for finding an inverse, you're going to notice that things are just a little bit different. I mean, don't worry about it being a fraction. We've already dealt with fractions already. But notice that we have two different instances of x. So since we have that situation, this is not going to be one of those problems where we can do that order of operations and go backwards because there's too much going on here. So we are going to have to go through the algebraic process step by step very, very carefully in order to find the inverse. And once we're done finding the inverse, we're going to talk about how certain key pieces of information about this function will compare to the inverse just to wrap everything up so that you can see x becomes y, y becomes x. Okay. Now the first step here is to rewrite f of x as y. So y is equal to 3x plus 2 all over x plus 5. All right, well then we're supposed to replace the x with y's and the y's with x. So that now becomes x is equal to 3y plus 2 over y plus 5. Now you see the problem that we're going to have here. We're supposed to solve for y, but we've got y in two different spots. This does make things more complicated, but we've got this. Now, if I just write x as x over 1, then we're going to be in really good shape because we now have a proportion, and remember that in a proportion, the cross products are equal. So that means I can say x times y plus 5, and that's going to equal the other cross product of 1 times 3y plus 2. Now right now we have y in two different spots and that's going to be a problem, but we're going to fix that here in just a moment. Eventually we're going to get everything that has y to one side and anything that doesn't have y is going to go to the other side of the equation. But first let's multiply this out. So we have x times y, so just xy, plus 5x. On the right side, multiplying times 1 doesn't do anything for us. So we get this. Now what I just said is that everything that has y goes on one side. If you don't have y, you need to go to the other side, which means I'm going to move this 3y to the left to be with the other y's. But then this 5x needs to go to the other side because he doesn't have a y. So this becomes xy minus 3y because we have to subtract it over there. Subtracting the 5x over here becomes negative 5x plus 2. So now here's the trick. Pay attention to this trick because we're going to be seeing this at the very end of the semester. We need to get all the y's together. And the reason we wanted all the y's together is so that I can factor out that common factor which happens to be y. So there's a y here and here. So we factor out the y and we're left with x minus 3. Now, what's really neat about this is that you go from having y in two different spots to having just one instance of y, which makes it really easy to finish solving this for y, because to get y by itself, you need to get rid of this factor of x minus 3. So divide both sides by x minus 3, like this. So y equals, now be careful where you put that negative. That negative is connected only to the 5x, so it's negative 5x plus 2 over x minus 3. Don't put the negative in front unless you're prepared to do some other manipulations. All right, so we have y by itself, and the last step is to rewrite this. So f inverse is equal to negative 5x plus 2 all over x minus 3. And that's your inverse. All right, so I'm going to rewrite that back up here at the top because I want us to be able to see uh, some things that are similar yet very different between the original function and what we have here for the inverse. All right, so here you have a function and you have its inverse. Alright, so I need you to see this. For my function, his domain, 
Well, his domain is only limited by what you have in the denominator, so the denominator can't be equal to zero. So the value of x that makes this equal to zero is negative five. So your domain is everything but negative five. And so it looks like that. And his range, now this is something that we don't really have time to cover in this class, but the range is going to be from negative infinity to three union three to infinity. Now based on what I've written here, you should be able to figure out that the horizontal asymptote is y equals three. You see that's the guy that's missing in your range. And the vertical asymptote for my function is x equals negative five because that is what made the denominator equal to zero, which made the expression undefined. And you also see how it's missing here from the domain. Okay, If you go on and you talk about what is your x-intercept, your x-intercept, that x value is going to come from what makes the numerator equal zero. What makes 3x plus 2 equal zero? Well, that would be negative 2 thirds. And then the y-intercept is just plugging in zero and seeing what you have. So 3 times zero, and that's going to become zero, and you're left with 2 over 5. So that's what we have for our function. Now, if that's my function, and if this is truly my inverse, that means x becomes y, y becomes x, which means for my inverse function, his domain, his x values, are going to come from the y values from the original function. So his domain is this guy's range. So his domain is going to be everything but 3. And when you look at this function, you understand why it's everything but 3, because 3, when you plug it in here, would give you a denominator of 0, which makes the expression undefined. So everything but 0. Or assume everything but 3. His range is going to be the original function's domain. So from negative infinity to negative five, union, negative five to infinity. All right, let's see what else we can get here. Your original function has a horizontal asymptote of y equals three, which means for me, that becomes a vertical asymptote not y equals 3, but x equals 3, which again corresponds to that hiccup that you have in the domain. You had a vertical asymptote for your original function, which means you'll have a horizontal asymptote for your inverse. But instead of it being x equals negative 5, because that's a vertical line, it's going to correspond to the horizontal line y equals negative 5, and again that connects with this little blip that we have right there for the range. Two more pieces. You have an x-intercept, which means I'll have a y-intercept that looks very similar to this, but again, we're talking about ordered pairs, and when you go from a function to its inverse, the ordered pair gets flipped around. So this becomes zero and negative two-thirds. And what would be a y-intercept for the function becomes an x-intercept for its inverse. Swap those guys around and you get two fifths comma zero. Now remember what I just said about how do you find the y-intercept? You find the y-intercept by plugging in zero. So if I plug in zero here and here, these guys go away and I'm left with two over negative three, which is negative two thirds. I said to find the x-intercept, you set the numerator equal to zero. So if I set this guy equal to zero and I solve it, I end up with a positive 2 over 5. So everything is all connected. As you go from a function to its inverse, x becomes y, y becomes x, and everything matches up. Really fun, right? Just wait till we get to the next little section where the big concept, the big two functions that we're dealing with, are inverses of each other. I really love it. It's super fun because we're going to be talking about exponentials and logarithms.